It's Sunday, December 19th, 2021, and you're listening to episode 586 of Fear the Boot, the show about tabletop role-playing games and a little bit more. Running time for this episode is 40 minutes. Welcome to Fear the Boot. My name is Dan. This is Wayne. And my name is Chad. All right, so two things real quick, and then we're going to jump into it. First off, we're going to be doing somewhat shorter episodes for a couple of weeks just because I don't want to lose what consistency we've rebuilt with our episode releases, but that doesn't change the fact that we are going into that black hole time of year. Secondly, there is a call out I got to give. There's there's a shout out here. Outside of the hand drawn on notebook paper, platinum entities we awarded ourselves, <laughs> Fear the Boot has never given out an award of any kind to anyone, and we're probably not going to start now. But if we did, mm-hmm. I know who the first, whatever we called it, the first booty. Oh, it would be the Dreamy Pete Award. Yes. And I want to tell you guys why, because this story freaking amazes me. Mm-hmm. And I am happy to talk about it because. It's based on a Kickstarter and what's going on with it. And this is a Kickstarter we, I don't think, talked about on the show. We are not involved in it. I don't even know what product it is. I just know the story. Yeah, I'm I not believe e- the Kickstarter is already done. Too, yeah. So you can't even. Oh, yeah, it's definitely done. Can't yeah. Get in on it. And I'm not even backing it. I have literally no dog in this fight apart from the fact that. That having met and interacted with Pete Petruccio. Dreamy Pete. Yeah. yeah. I, I Screw don't, you, you wonderful man. You didn't get his money. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have Brodor's level of lust, but I know he's a really good guy. He is. I, I have interacted with him at some conventions and such. So right now, it may shock some of you to find out there's this disease going around the globe and all these economic issues. And that has messed up a lot of industries probably one of the bigger, more noticeable ones being shipping. Mm -hmm. So Pete, trying to fulfill his Kickstarter, notices that his product has been sitting in this warehouse stuck there on pallets for quite a while. Yeah, now an an uncomfortably long time. Now, I think a reasonable individual could go onto Kickstarter and could just make update posts and just say, hey, stuck in the warehouse, Mm -hmm. there's no trucks available at the moment, they're backed up. Everyone knows what's going on in terms, once again, world economy and all these crazy things. The moment it frees up, we're sending it out. Right, and I I cannot imagine any decent, reasonable human being would have had a problem with that. So Pete could have done that, but he didn't. Instead, he's like, you know what? I don't like the fact that this is going on. So the dude runs out rents his own truck like i don't know where he got it It was like a u-haul or something drives out to this warehouse figures out how to back this truck up to a shipping dock figures out how to get there and get the lading and all that stuff without you know getting shot or arrested it's like and he's (laughs) he's got this truck there's pictures of it that you can find on facebook if you follow Mm -hmm. him on facebook of this truck of his dwarfed by yet snuggled closely (laughs) between 18 wheelers on either side Mm -hmm. as he's got all the way up to the loading dock of this place and they took a forklift put it on the pallets and he just took it himself that is crazy Mm -hmm. and i mean crazy in a good way this is like unheard of levels nobody does this nobody does this yeah the big guys they don't do it watsy doesn't do this all of them don't do I mean, they can't because it's stupid. And, you know, why would you do it? It's you, customer service. Exactly. Yeah, You'd actually have to be dedicated to do you, this. You stuff. have to, like, love your fans and love people and want to do the right thing like Dreamy Pete does. Yeah. For us, we're amazed, right? And we're Midwesterners. We got that Midwestern nice sort of thing going. For Pete, this is just what you do. So, yeah. Yeah. It's so, amazing. Huge round of applause on that, man. That is awesome. And once again, I don't say this as someone who's got any dog in this whatsoever. Well, you're going to have to find out what the game is and get a copy is what you're going to have to do now. I guess Brodor would know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't be able to express it. He'd just be like I, I all know, over himself. I, say, I know he's got two out there. One of them is about dysfunctional housemates, and then mm-hmm. another one's about 
food inspector. It's called Chewy. If you, I don't know, look yeah. up Pete's page. He's got this all figured out. But the we'll point link to it. it. Chew is based on the comic book Chew. Oh, neat. But yeah, the point. Once again, I don't know. I can't say enough things about how this just. When I saw this come across my well, Facebook feed. Well, he gets the feed. first annual Dreamy Pete Award. Yes, he does. He gets. Pete Petrucci gets the first annual Pete Petrucci and Award. Once we dig your <laughs> yeah. printer out of the closet and hook it up, we'll print him out an award. Why? Our Platinum Annie was done on notebook paper. <laughs> well, <that's, laughs> well, we got to dig that out, too, now. So. Don't you have a picture, like a page left of your bad dragon coloring book? <laughs> I I don't know if I threw that away. I actually don't what? know what I did with that. You never, A, why would you throw a bad dragon coloring book away? I think and it was B, a full activity book. That's just you hard. don't throw anything away, Dan. Yeah, that was something that used to be true. Oh, you're cleaning house? You're Marie Conoing your life? No, that would happen post-divorce. <laughs> oh, he's like, oh, no. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. That happened post-divorce. Oh, where Did Carla get your bad dragon activity? No, 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 no. That was here. Oh, okay. No, all of that made it here. Like, it all got moved out of the house rather quickly. But, I mean, you remember, there yeah. used to, in my living room, there was this huge pile of stuff. Right. And yep. I would not move it. Swords, guns, boxes, books, sex books. Papers, tons Pictures and tons of Pictures of naked paper. women. I mean, and yeah. The reason it never got moved was I said, I am not going to move anything unless I'm either throwing it away or putting it away. Mm-hmm. And the reason it took so long for me to clean that stack up is because I kept reaching the limit of what the trash company would take. Mm. You would not believe how much stuff I have thrown out. My old ways, okay, I'm a, more of a hoarder than you are, Chad, which is not, <laughs> not saying not enough. not because yeah. <laughs> the average homeless person has more things than you do. But I'm just saying that I am nowhere near what I used to be in terms of keeping things eternally. Yeah. You know, I am much more aggressive about throwing things mm-hmm. away if I can't really justify their existence. If they don't spark joy. Yeah. yeah. All right. So anyways, what we're going to talk about here in this shortened episode, there is a game and we're not going to talk about the game. We're going to talk about a concept it raises. Mm-hmm. This is a game that's been around for a while. It is a game masterless card game called For the Queen. But it's yeah, still it's, what I would consider a role playing. Yeah, game. and if you've yeah. never heard of it, I will link it in the show notes so you can check out the product yourself. It's a ton of fun to play. Mm-hmm. Wayne, you said you figured out how to explain it in brief, so shoot. Yeah, I describe it as a storytelling card game where you go around the table pulling cards that ask you questions and you are creating your role around that. The question could be, why do you love the queen? What was the last horrible thing the queen did to you? Mm -hmm. And that is the entire game. Yeah. And isn't there a general narrative that you're on a trip? Yeah. yeah. There's like three sentences of the realm is is at war, has been at war for years. The queen is leading a, a diplomatic delegation to the enemy and enemy lands. And she is only taking you with her retinue, the people sitting around. Yeah, yeah. Around, and you around, keep yeah. going around until you draw the last card that says the queen has been ambushed. Do you defend her? Yeah. And so you are building this emergent story off of the questions mm. that are asked on these cards. Now, there's a lot we could dig into here. There are several things that we are not going to cover because they would require a lot more discussion. For example, Game Masterless Systems. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're going to get into. A product review of For the Queen. Yeah, or or whatever. It is really good, though. But But what I want to talk about is the fact that what this game demonstrates is a truth that we have observed at conventions and elsewhere, which is, number one, a story prompt or a story setup can lead to a whole lot of games that a basic elevator pitch of a game. A lot of times people are real hesitant to reuse them and say, well, I've done that idea before, but the way these games evolve, especially the less that you put in stone at the start of the game are so different. And probably the easiest place we've seen this is at conventions running the same plot for multiple groups across different slots at the convention. Love doing it because every time it will be drastically different because the people sitting in front of you are drastically different. Yeah, Mm -hmm. even with a home group. Honestly, even with the same group of people, I have done this with past groups where we have taken a game's elevator pitch, played it once, and it played out one way. 
And then people are like, you know what? I want to change up the character I'm playing and even some very early choices we made. And as long as you're not trying to just recreate the exact experience, you end up with a radically different story. That's the neat thing about For the Queen, too, because it really demonstrates that. We've played this game like five times, I think. Yeah. Same people, same setup, five times. Now, the the queen is because the queen is a picture, right? There's not even any words on it. It's just There's nothing mechanically different about the queen's picture. It's just something sitting there to give you an idea. Right. Yeah. And you could print a picture out of the Queen of England. Actually, one of the cards is the Queen of England. <laughs> not a fancy queen. But, but yeah, every time we've done it, it's been radically different. Like the first time we did it, we were surprised about how much we enjoyed the game. And then we were like, do you want to do it again? And we're like, yeah, yeah. let's like, see if it's different. Yeah, like not another day. Right. We played it two times in a row, back, yeah, back to back, back to back, to back to back. Not even like take a break, do something else. Literally, let's set this up again. I think what helps, and not just in For the Queen, but in any role-playing game where there's like this emergent narrative storyline, I find it happens a lot in games that are not crunchy, that don't have a lot of rules to get in the way. Not to say that a lot of rules are bad or anything, but it comes from the role play. It comes from the storytelling. It comes from the people sitting around at the table telling the story of their character and then additionally having input on other people's characters. Yeah. yeah. And so when you do it again, whatever you're doing, you can think of, well, man, that I had some really cool ideas that I wish we would have explored the first time. Let's explore those now. Or, man... That was really fun. I'm really glad I chose this character that was a complete bootlicker. You know, just a complete and total slime bootlicker. And I'm not going to do that this time. I'm going to play somebody who is totally the opposite, different. I'm going to play the rebel spy, yeah. who, you know, yeah. does whatever. Well, I played uh, Quiet Year twice over the weekend. Mm -hmm. And one thing I find with both games that can come up in uh, trying to do this with a role-playing game as well, both of those games have decks of cards. and as you're pulling them randomly, the same card could go to two different people, two different yeah. times, and they will interpret the card and they'll answer it differently based on the play session you're in. Yeah. Same thing. If you wanted to do this with a role playing game, come at it with different characters. Yeah. You know, once you have a different character, you may be asked the exact same question and have a completely different answer. Do no. something completely differently because it's not the same character. I think it helps that there are prompts in games like this or concepts like this is that there's always some sort of prompt going on. So like take lasers and feelings, for example, you do something, any of the powered by the apocalypse type stuff, you roll and you succeed. Great. That's actually really boring, but it's great. You, you succeeded. The player's happy. You move on. There's not much meat on the bone to work with. You succeed, but there's a problem. Or you fail, what is the problem? It is those questions that kind of give you little nudges in direction. And if the right group of players starts exploring in those directions, that's where the sort of emergent gameplay comes out. So you can do the same starting point and have it be really different every yeah, time. Yeah, and prompts and questions. And I guess questions are a subtype of prompt. But I was using them differently because mm -hmm. I was meaning prompt to be more declarative as opposed to interrogative. You know, so something you're stating as opposed to something you're asking. Yeah. But both of these things, they give you a really flexible framework to work within because people are going to interpret them and interact with them a bit differently. And there's probably going to be a bunch of links in the show because hmm. we've already talked about a couple things. Totally gonna, not a product hmm. review show, but we're I'm going to link gonna, a lot of products. Yeah, I'm going to talk about a few more. In the past, we talked about Rory Story Cubes. Yes. Which are these wonderful dice that all they have on them is different pictures that don't mean anything except what you want them to mean. Let's say you're playing for the queen and for some reason inside of the cards using Rory Story Cubes. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're playing D&D. You can right. totally do that. Yeah. And the players have come to a town and you just brain farted and don't mm -hmm. know where you're going from here. You toss a couple of Rory story cubes and all of a sudden you roll a picture of a liquid boiling in a vial or a flask and a picture of a guy in a boat. Like, oh, 
okay, great. What am I going to do with this? Yeah. You know, well, okay, there's a ship in town and the ship has a cargo that you see a whole lot of guards around. It's this barrel of some mm. kind of liquid. What is it? Maybe you don't even know as a game master, yeah. but this is going to be enough to get the player's interest. And then as they get on board and start asking questions, you spitball, you make stuff up, throw another one of these dice. Maybe you just listen to their paranoid ramblings. And by there, I mean <laughs> that of the players and you start off of that building some kind of story. You start adding detail to the story, which is kind of the opposite of the way I typically GM, but I'm going to assert that there is a particular virtue that the less you define, mm -hmm. the more room you give for a novel and evolving yep. story. Inspectors. Mm -hmm. Inspectors is another great example. The G and another link. Yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> the GM doesn't say what happens when you're successful. You yes. do. And mm -hmm. that means, let's say you're running inspectors for four people around the table. You've got four different people that are creating world elements for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the other part of this is the interrogatives or the questions, whether it's something like for the queen or inspectors or blades in the dark, you roll a success and let's say it's a full success. Let's not even mm -hmm. deal with it being tempered by a bit of failure. You just roll a straight success. Like, okay. What exactly did you do? Right. You know, you went to stop this guy and you rolled a success. What exactly did you do? You know, did you knock him over? Did you get him all tied up in a some kind of sleeper hold? Did you just get the weapon out of his hand? See, this is why traditional, normal, traditional, standard role-playing games are a little dull to me. Because you have rules where your only interaction with the world through the rules is hitting something. You look at something like inspectors or blades or any of these other kind of like fate, whatever. I want to stop him and I roll and I'm successful. Okay, well, how did you stop him? Well, in D&D, &D, I hit him with my sword or I tap this skill of command or taunt and I stop him. Well, of course, I mean, basically, that's the same thing. It's, it's like a video game, right? Most video games, you're a guy and you have a gun and your interaction with the world is pulling the trigger. Like you see a plant, it's a weird looking plant. Looks different than all the other little plants in this for in this alien forest I'm in. Wonder if I can interact with it or do something with it. Well, the only thing I can do is pull the trigger and shoot it. So I'm going to shoot it. Yeah. So now I'm a guy standing in the woods shooting a plant. <laughs> And or maybe you have a use yeah, button. Yeah, maybe have a, maybe I'm rubbing my face on the plant, <laughs> or maybe I take out a piece of equipment and I rub the piece of equipment on the plant. And I think that a lot of role playing games that have a ton of crunchy, real crunchy rules to them, very simulation oriented games, people kind of portray them as, well, look at all this stuff you can do to this very exacting sense of reality. Everything is fair and defined exactly what you can do. And it's like, yeah, it's too defined. Yeah, we talked about it before, though. It's a case of the right tool for the right, right type of story. I don't want to play a mystery in Inspectors. Right. If I'm trying to discover something... I don't want to tell I, you what I'm supposed to be discovering in your mystery. Yeah, you, exactly. Yeah. Well, I say Inspectors is a mystery game, but it's a comedy mystery. It's not actually what I well, assume you're referring to is like a by-the-numbers Agatha yeah. Christie who done it. I don't want to play like the type of mystery game I'm talking about is where there is a mystery and I'm trying to uncover it. For me, the enjoyment of that is discovering what that mystery is. Yeah. Not defining that mystery as True. a player. Yeah. And in inspectors, when you're successful, you define, you know, let's say I successfully pick the lock and open the box. I want to know what's in the box, but in inspectors yeah. to say Chad's running, he looks at me and says, okay, what was in the box? Right. Because that is an integral part of games like Inspectors. The Game Master is not supposed to come to the table knowing all this stuff with this huge amount of, of notes and whatnot. It is the players guiding it. And you're right, it, it works in some cases, like a yeah. comedy sort of game like Inspectors where well, it's very zany, that works. But A good example, when I was doing The Quiet Year, mm -hmm. things were going really normal. I knew that this was a game that could get out there. We had nothing really science fiction-y or supernatural or anything. So I discovered something. I discovered a cyborg, a dead cyborg body. Mm -hmm. 
there are now cyborgs in the world. Yep. Because as a player, I wanted to add a science fiction element to it. And when I run a fantasy D&D like game, I don't want my players introducing cyborgs. Right. Now, and believe me, I mean, you guys both know I give players a huge latitude in defining stuff in the game, but I still don't want a cyborg magically appearing in my D&D game. Yeah. If I'm running Skies of Glass, I don't want a level 45 mage to walk around the corner. Right. Yeah, you know, what's kind of interesting about this is once play starts, people seem to have this real aversion to answering open-ended questions or to making their own story prompts, despite the fact that that is literally what the act of character creation is. Right. The very act of character creation is this is who I am, this is where I came from, this is why I'm here. Traditional role-playing games have two golden boxes. You always talk about your golden box, which is your character sheet. Yeah. The other golden box is the game itself. The dungeon master, the game master's game, the story, the rules, the, that sort of thing. The larger box of the world is in its own golden box. And I want to break both boxes. I want the players to break into my golden box of the world and to start adding their own stuff and starting to change it within the confines yeah. of the box. Again, I don't want a cyborg falling out of the sky because my players declared it in my fantasy game. But I also want to break into the players' characters to start asking them hard questions, seeing how they feel about stuff, taking them out of their comfort zone because that tension creates story. Sure. And again, I think it goes both ways, right? The player does not want whatever the hell the equivalent is of a cyborg in their fantasy game happening with their character either. Yeah. I think one of the things you can do to help people with that in a game, because I can imagine that one of the difficulties a lot of game masters are going to have is players are either too quiet, too reserved, or maybe simply too uncertain, too new mm. to the hobby, whatever. And if you ask them a super open-ended question, they may not be prepared. I see that a lot to, in our Blades A. To jump out and mm -hmm. say, I'm just going to take the reins and insert story here, or I'm just going to go ahead and start writing things into this, improving my own sort of stuff. So how do you get these people off the bench? And I think one of the things you can do is something that Ryan Frederick described very well, and we had a whole episode dedicated to this, something else in the show notes, <laughs> uh, which is giving people options or a prompt that might have a little more actionable detail. Instead of, let's say, D&D &D game, instead of asking, why is your wizard here? Mm -hmm. Because that may kind of lock them up a bit. You could ask them something a little more specific, like, what types of things do you think would interest you in this town? What types of things would draw you to a town in general? Is it the promise of adventure? Is it that you're looking for somebody you've lost? Is it that you're looking for someone to train you up in a new type of magic or something like that? Or you're trying to research an ancient legend? You can give them some ideas. And as an extension of that, I think where you as a game master can help yourself is to make sure that if you're trying to run a game that is heavily driven by these questions and prompts, instead of writing your notes as a connect the dots series of, you know, this is what's in this room and then here's the box text that describes what's in there and here's what's there and then the next room and the next room mm -hmm. and the next room or a plot that's out in the open but is written in an essentially linear manner like that. Write out some questions and prompts, but give yourself some things to work with. For example, let's keep going with D&D. &D. Maybe don't define that the bad guy is an evil wizard who's secretly a dragon. Maybe come up with a couple of NPC ideas and have a question for yourself. Which of these are the characters treating in the worst way? Now mm. you know who's about to become the bad guy. <laughs> And that's not something you have to have defined in advance. I mean, yeah, you might have a few options or prompts. Mm -hmm. And then as you see how and why they abuse him or whatever the case is, you start to get some ideas. 
but write these questions out in advance. Have questions for your players. Describe to them that there's a large ship in harbor. And then ask them, have any of your characters been at sea before? Mm-hmm. If they sit there like knots on law, As a chorus, they're all like, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, fantastic. And that'd be yeah. great. I'd chase yeah. that. Why? Yeah. Or did you not live near water? Are you afraid of boats? Are you afraid of water? It's you, not on my character sheet. <laughs> you know, now, and I, I will stress here, this is not going to work with every group. Right. This is not going to work with all people. I realize some people are so passive. Mm-hmm. They so badly want to be spoon fed. Well, and that's this. It. I was being aggressively right. passive. I wouldn't say passive aggressive, but aggressively Absolutely passive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And for some people, this is going to be a non-starter. Right. The advice here is that if you have a group that's got at least some degree of imagination and proactivity, you can allow the story to grow from a not clearly defined path of events as long as you have these questions, these ideas well, that pop up along the way. And another piece of advice I'd give to is that if you have a person who is on the more passive side and you're doing like some sort of prodding questions, prompting questions to kind of get a little bit more out of them or maybe not even out of their character, just get them to engage with a little bit of your plot so that they give more, you know, improv sort of stuff. If you have a passive player, ask your open-ended probing question, and they might not come back with it. They'd be like, well, have you ever been out to see anymore? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Cool. No pressure. Think about it. Give me an answer in a few minutes. Think about like, were your parents fishermen? Were you out in the sea? Pirates? Anything you want. I'll come back to you in a few minutes. Yeah. And Wayne, you, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And what you just did right there was the... You gave them, I gave them a couple of prompts. You gave them a couple yep. of prompts. You gave them a couple ideas. And they could say, well, maybe my parents were fishermen. Mm-hmm. So Pirate if, fishermen. If they're completely oh blanked out... They killed moisture farmers. <laughs> if they're completely just blanked out and yeah. can't think of anything, you've given them something they can potentially latch on to and move you, forward with. Trust me on this one. I speak from years of experience here. When you ask somebody like that in that situation a question, have you ever been out to sea? And they look at you and their eyes go wide and they're like, um, uh, do not press the question. Do not say, well, have you? What do you think? Be- well, you know, I noticed that you have fisherman parent lineage on your character. You got them. You sprung something on them. They're taking a step back. Yeah. If you keep pressure on them, you make it worse. Yeah. They're never going to answer you. And worse, when you try it again later on in a different game, it breaks trust. Yeah. Not in a bad, horrible way, like, you know, slapping them in the face or something, but it puts them in an uncomfortable place, gives them an uncomfortable memory. Yeah. That's why you give them a couple prompts, say no pressure, think about it, we will come back in a few minutes. You, you give them prompts, you tell them it's okay, and you set an expectation, and then you take one hundred percent of the focus away from them and you put it on wayne because wayne's your go-to guy wayne's <laughs> wayne can help you with the rules he's there with the improv and he's always up for a plan i've never been on a boat because i have this huge phobia of the water oh my god And when i get on a boat i'm afraid it's gonna sink why would it sink do you just do it's you, a phobia it's a phobia Don't oh, you know how phobias work no tell me Exactly. Because I'm the lazy gym and I just want to talk and burn up time until I can you know, kick these people out yeah, of my house. And, and that is something that if we go back to the model of For the Queen, we can draw on is the questions on those cards are relatively narrow. Mm-hmm. Now, they're open ended, but they are relatively narrow. For example, something like what is it the queen did to betray your trust? Yeah. yeah. Now, that's. On the one hand, an open-ended question, but it is not so open-ended that it's like... It's a pointed question. What's happened between you and the queen? It's a very pointed question. It presupposes something. The queen has done something. That's just a given. And now, how did you feel about it? And what's neat about it is that if you get that question or that kind of question later in the game, if it's not the first card you draw, because if it's the first card you draw, how has the queen betrayed you? Well, I guess I'm a person who hates the queen now. I mean, that's the sort of the natural thought. But if you have a lineup of cards in front of you, you've been playing for like 20 minutes, you have like five cards in front of you, and it's all stuff like, good thing, the queen helped me 
when she didn't have to. The queen saved my life. The queen was charitable to my family. Then you get how did the queen betray you. Now, that's a fucking story. Now, let's go to a good old D&D game once again. You're sitting there in the tavern, and the guy walks up and says, I've got a job offer for you and plenty of coin to pay. All right, let's keep this as <laughs> basic as we can get it. But it's Boblin the Goblin. You then to start talking to the party and having a little bit of role play. Maybe at this point, you don't even know it's in the dungeon. All right, you just know there's a dungeon out there. And the guy says, well, this one's upset a lot of adventurers, so I got to know in advance. What are you guys afraid of? <laughs> and not getting paid and no wait that's what my you know enemies what? <laughs> not getting paid you just gave me a plot idea exactly so now maybe this guy's gonna stiff him on the payment well not only did and you we'll, give did i give you a plot idea i opened the door for you to knock my character down a peg yeah obviously this guy needs that so now he's <laughs> gonna go out into the your character's gonna go out into the middle of the wilderness where the dungeon's supposed to be and all that's laying there is uh, some random dude who's like, no, I'm just camping here. I don't know what's going on. And behind the GM screen, you're doing a bunch of rolls to pick pockets. Yeah. And <laughs> the group ends up robbed and comes back and find out, no, there never was anyone legit in this town mm -hmm. offering jobs. And his bag is not full of gold coins at all. Right. He's walking around running the scam on people from town to town. If they say something really hard ass, like, what are you afraid of? nothing mm -hmm. great every monster that requires a save versus fear is now in this dungeon right. we're gonna teach you to we're be gonna afraid of something you're gonna walk out of this dungeon with a fear of something and develop your character yeah. further <laughs> and i will say there there are caveats to this too so let's say you do have a really good group with deep interesting cool characters that have a lot of depth and emotion and stuff and they are afraid of things or they they do want these challenges and that sort of stuff it isn't just about money and i'm a hard ass a complete stranger in a hood walks up to them in a seedy bar at a bad part of town armed to the teeth and says what are you afraid of yeah. and it's just like uh nothing you incredible douche nozzle <laughs> I mean, it's like yeah that's that's what that's what i'm i'm afraid done. of telling strangers my fears right it's like, i'm afraid of getting a disease Great. from you your bad breath that's... you're afraid of telling strangers your fears well guess what now we're going to involve a whole lot of divination mm -hmm. and <laughs> mind reading and all kinds of other stuff and, and my character is going to like start involving like just punching people <laughs> random str npc walks up to him hey would you like to buy that's a question Ugh! i know what happens with you guys <laughs> I'm taking him out before I say, oh, no, I created another plot point for the GM to punish us. God, this game sucks. Where's my golden box? I'm going to close this out with a bit of reassurance and a bit of advice. All right. Though, before I get to those, I want to just very quickly reemphasize something, which, as with everything we talk about in this show, this is not a one size fits all way to run your games. This is not the proper fun trademark. This is simply something that you ought to consider as a way of running games. Now, here's the bit of reassurance. If you're not that fast on your feet of coming up with prompts, there are a lot of gaming tools available that I'm not going to link because Google <laughs> will help you find them. And <laughs> we have a link to Google now. Great. <laughs> and what I'm talking about is you go out to Google and type in something like random and then whatever you want, you will find that tool. I've been sitting there at a game and I'm just not feeling super creative. They walk into a location and I need a shopkeeper that's kind of interesting. Go on to Google, random personality quirks, enter. You will find a website where you can click a button that will give you two, three, four, five at a time until you find something you can work with and you're ready to go. And if you've got your phone, your laptop, your tablet sitting there, you can do this pretty fast. My advice on that, though, is if you do that, set your phone to where it is unlocked so yeah. that you don't sit there entering codes in and that actually maybe have that page already pulled up or, and then it's, or note card this yeah. stuff or put it oh, on look, pieces of paper. Oh, look, I got an email. Oh, it's yeah. yeah. I say, or if you don't want to do that, fine. Pre-print out some of these yeah. things random character quirks, random this, random that, random names, and have them in some pieces of paper sitting in front of you or some note cards sitting in front of you. It's better than my idea of looking behind Chad's head at the bookshelf 
and just randomly picking things out of the books because he knows what's on his bookshelf. That's true. I played under a GM who did that. All of his Star Wars names <laughs> were derived from things sitting on shelves. For example, yeah, we wa- Chad called me on that once when I gave the name of a character, and he turns around and picks up the book. For <laughs> example, we once ran into a character, first, a very Star Warsy name, last name Har, first name Sieg, like S E E G. It's like Sieg Har, right? He was looking at a box of cigars. Huh. <laughs> I mean, you've got Chewbacca. Chewing tobacco. tobacco God, yeah. Star Wars has the worst name. It does. Star Wars is just awful. All right, it's but here's terrible. here's my piece of Dan of Fear the Boot dot com. <laughs> here's my piece <laughs> of closing advice. If this is something you're still not sure how to do, what I'm going to recommend is mashing two games together. Go grab a copy of For the Quaint. All right, the setup for your adventure. You're playing a D and D game. You're playing whatever game you want. Call the queen whatever you want. If it's not a D&D game, fine. She's an emissary from an alien race that you're trying to get to a peace summit. Okay, it doesn't matter. There's someone that you are escorting or something important that you are escorting. Set out the deck for For the Queen, but otherwise run a standard role-playing game. When the game starts, give a starting scene. You guys are sitting around. You get your orders to escort this emissary to the peace conference now go around the table have the characters work through a couple of those cards and then be like okay now your starship drops out of warp and you guys are over the plan and a little bit of plot happens and the emissary comes up on to the bridge of the ship to talk to the officers before you guys beam down to the peace conference do another round of the cards and just keep going on like that DD game okay you're going through a dungeon and you have to get Queen Elizabeth and you have to get Queen Elizabeth from the entrance to the exit. And mm-hmm. there's there's dungeon and goblins in the middle as she you're was in World War Two, man, as you're walking and talking She's tough. Well, I'm, I'm not saying she has to be a damsel in distress. I mean, whatever. I mean, she is almost 100, though. Your game, do whatever you want to do. But, you know, you walk through that place a bit. You're part of her entourage or part of her party or whatever the case may be answer a few of those questions during role play because she's talking to you guys or he's talking you guys doesn't have to be a queen you guys are conversing go through a few of those cards and then suddenly you have a room where you got to clear and loot goblins and orcs and you take their shoes and then you move (laughs) on to the next part and there's a puzzle you got to do and then beyond that you guys does queen elizabeth help with the puzzle or does she just stately stand aloof from the, Great question. From the Let's situation. do a round of cards and see what we think after those cards How come How has yeah. the queen betrayed you? By not helping with a f***ing puzzle, Queen Elizabeth. And you know what? Did that... <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Beautiful. It's a modern game and you have to get the band queen <laughs> to the concert. <laughs> nice. Yes. The, but they only speak in the royal we. Yeah. Right. And Freddie Mercury's there and he's a zombie. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. But we shall play at Wimbledon. <laughs> We shall be the undead. All right. So we do like fat bottom girls. Check the show notes for a buttload of links. <laughs> and how many links do you think we'll have? Now you can't cheat, Dan, and go. No, no, with I, the, yeah, I, I, like, I'm ballparking. Like, uh-huh. uh, it's like how many jelly beans are in the jar? Six to eight. Six to eight. Wayne. Wow. I'll go seven. I will say fifteen. Okay. I pretend these are potentially. Obviously, Dan could. Put in the no, no, I, but I, you, but I, I no, do not. No, no, but, I will link what we said we're going to link, what okay. makes sense to link. I will not skew the numbers up or right. down. So we'll see which one which of us means we have to link Google. I, <laughs> I'm not linking we were, Google. We said we were going to link Google. No, you <laughs> said yeah. I was going to link if Google. We had He's four... speaking in the royal we. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's no link to Google in the show notes. If we hit 14 and Google would have been 15, All right. I'm going to be pissed. I'll grant you that. I will grant you that okay. exception to the rule. If we okay. hit 14, I will add Google 13, to make it 15. 13's fine. Yeah. 16 is right out. No, it 14. Right. Yep. Okay. All right. So... Cool. As always, thank you guys for tuning in. This is a fair call. Have a great week and great games, and we will catch you next time. Yeah. This has been a production of Fear the Boot, copyright 2021. Listeners are free to use this episode in a non-commercial endeavor, so long as credit is provided to feartheboot.com. You can find previous episodes and other resources at feartheboot.com. If you wish to support this show and its related endeavors, you can do so at patreon.com slash feartheboot.